All right, we just want to talk you through uh, servicing your AGT. So this is for uh, for owners if they want to do their own servicing, but also if you're a mechanic and you have a customer ask you to, to service their AGT, just so you can be familiar with you know what filters you need and oils and what grease points to look for and a few little uh, tricks just getting familiar with it all. So I'm going to start off with basics like. Uh, just a regular service, you know, greasing and uh, engine oil change that you'd, uh, well, greasing, you know, the operator should be doing that every, uh, at least every 50 hours. And uh, except for their rotor, they should do it every, well, five hours, the book says. But, um, but yeah, your regular service, uh, you'll be doing an engine oil change and greasing and, uh, you know, a few other things to, to check over. So we'll do those first, and then we'll go on to the, the major service items. So uh, first of all, I mean, you know, ideally you'd have the tractor washed down. This one hasn't been washed down, and uh, just for the purpose of the exercise, we just thought we'd you know leave it like that because that's the way a lot of people, um, you know, if you're out doing the service for a, a customer, you may not have the facilities to wash it down. But uh, best thing to clean it down with is this anyway. Um, you know, uh, all the critical areas at least anyway. Uh, the main one being on the top of the, the gearbox in here. You might want to put it in here. Okay? And uh, just to clean around that fitting there, that's where you fill your oil and check your oil level. And you know, you can get dirt and rubbish built up around there. And you just want to blow that area clean before you go undoing that, that uh, bit stick there. Uh, and anyway, there's other areas too, around your greasy pools and so on. Um, it's just easier than wiping them all individually. So I'm going to go over greasy pools first. Um, I think rather than, I'll, I'll do some of them, but the ones that are easy to point to, I'll just, um, I'll just point to them. So um, there's, there's 10 greasy pools on the tractor. There's five at the engine end and five at the at the PGO end. So um, actually that leads me to, to explain to, it's a bit confusing or can be confusing with these tractors, uh, which is the front and which is the rear because um, you know the console rotates, you can face in the direction. And uh, most of our customers, you know, most people that own an AGT will have it facing this way almost all of the time. Uh, and uh, they sort of tend to call this the front and that the back. If you read the operator's manual, technically the engine is the, is the front end and the PTO end is, is the rear end. So, you know, like for example, if you're ordering a mudguard, for example, this is the, the left rear mudguard. But then you'll usually have the customer describe this as the front right mudguard. So it can be confusing. So that's why we tend to. Rather than say front and rear, we tend to say engine end or PDO and it sort of takes any uh, chance of confusion out of it. So, um, yeah, so back to the grease pickles, there's, there's five at the uh, engine end, there's five at the PDO end. And um, most of them are pretty obvious, but there are, oh, actually I shouldn't say that, yeah, there are a few different ones, but these ones here are pretty obvious. The top of the, uh, the link the linkage lift arms there. Now when you grease those, the grease only goes in at the top, but it really wants to be at the bottom. So the best thing to do there is as you grease them, put a little bit of grease in there. Just a little bit so you see it oozing out. But then as you go up and down a little bit, you just let it work around a bit as you give it a little bit more. And that just ensures that you get, you get grease coverage within the pin. More. So obviously you can only do that when the implement is uh, is off the, the tractor, and that's the way you want to um, do it anyway. Do the service with the implement off the tractor because greasing the bottom of these lift cylinders is most easy to do if the arms are fully raised, and you don't want to be getting in underneath your implement as well. So. These ones are a little bit tricky. I'll just, uh, there's the end of the grease nipple there. I'm just wiping it cleanly in here. And, uh, yeah. Ooh, there we go, we got that one on. And, oh, just pop a bit in. 
and uh, that's how you do those ones. You can do it with it with the arms down, but you just got easier access if you have the arms raised. Now the other one is the cross shaft that goes across between here, the shaft inside that housing that connects it here to here, and it's opposite where I'm pointing there now. So if you look in there, you'll see it right up inside there. If you get in underneath there, you can get to it. Uh, while the grease, while the top link is in position, but if you want to make access easier, then you would take the the, uh, the top link off. And I might just do that because I want to show you something about that. Um, something you need to be aware of here if you're taking this top link off. Now, as we take this pin out, you'll see as it comes out here. See, it's almost clashing with this lift cylinder. Now, if the lift cylinder is uh, fully raised, it'll clear it. But if it's in sort of roughly the middle position, like it is there now, it won't clear it. Right? And if we take it all the way down, it clears again. Right? The reason I'm, you need to be aware of this is if you take that thing out there to take the top link out, I'll just sit that down now. Now, if, if you leave that like that and someone raises the, the linkage, you're gonna bend your pin, and at worst, you may even bust your housing there. Right? I had known someone to do it once and they bent the pin, luckily. Uh, but um, you don't wanna do that. So um, I'd suggest if you're gonna have take that out, I'll just go a little bit further and just take the pin out altogether, or, you know, put it back in again. But for the purpose of this video, I'm gonna take that out so that we can see in there, uh, to get to that uh, grease lift. We'll just freeze that now while we're going. There we go, we're on that. Now that one's not very demanding for grease. If you only did that every 200 hours, I wouldn't be concerned at all. I think that would be plenty. I'm not sure what the book says, that's just my opinion. Um, whereas these ones here and the bottom ones, uh, I'd like to see you do those quite regularly. The book probably says every 50 hours. If you can do it even more than that, it would be better. Uh, all right, so now that that's done, I'll put the top link back in. It always goes in the top pin position. Put that back up. Uh, all right, while we're at the, the TPO end of the tractor, these ball joints, they're not greasable, but they do like to be oiled. So, um, you know, some customers, some owners will oil them, some won't, but if you're a service guy and the customer isn't oiling them, like this one hasn't been oiled, um, I think it's a good fun to put a bit of oil on them, but it's not essential, but I recommend it. Okay, so that's that end. Let's go back up the engine end now. And um, so that was five at the, at the TGO end. There's five at the engine end, and if you come around here, yeah. You can see this one down here on the steering joint, the king piece. Uh, there's the top one, and oh, I've got one exactly the same down underneath there as well. Uh, there's, there's the bottom one. Okay, so obviously left and right. So there's four grease nipples. You can come up here. So. The other one is in the centre in the oscillation point. So you might just want to move to get out of the sunlight there, and there it is there. So directly down from the fuel tank, uh, the oscillation pin. And um, now when they're new, they can be quite tight to take grease in there. I'll just put this one on, because this is only a relatively new tractor. I'll just pump some into there and just see. Took grease easily to start with, but then it's built up pressure. And it is tight, but it is taking grease. Right, but that's typical, we'll just force it in, right, but because it's tight, it's got pressure on there, I'm probably not going to be able to remove that coupling straight away, just to allow that pressure to dissipate. Uh, and what you can do also, is if, if you're having trouble getting the grease to go in there, it's not flowing in, you can, uh, with an implement on, you can raise the rear end of the tractor and use the hydraulic levelling to make that oscillation joint work. And if you have it on an angle, you know, one way and 
pump up the grease gun and then while the pressure's on the grease gun, you know, angle it the other way and then pump it again, bring it back to centre, put it back on the ground and, and by working it with the pressure on that allows the grease to, to sort of spread around and dissipate into the pin. And uh, anyway, like I said, after, after the track has done a bit of work, you'll find it takes grease more easily. Um, but anyway, that's just something to, to be aware of. So that's it for grease uh, points. The lubrication of the seat slides. You know, there's the, the latch there to slide the seat back and forth. And, you know, it doesn't hurt to get a bit of oil in there. Uh, keep that working nice. And also where the console rotates. So this circle here, when you rotate the console, I'll show you, you lift the seat here, there's the latch for it. And as you lift it up, that locks in. You've got to have the gear levers on the neutral to do this, by the way. And then as you spin, spin it around, that's where it's rotating on. And uh, it depends how often they're being used. You know, most people never use the, the, the rotating console, and some people use it a lot. Um, so, um, but if they never use it, you'll find this one has this one hasn't been used. I'm quite sure. And you can see as I use it, there's a little bit of you know dusty sort of grease oozing out of there. Uh, it's still turning okay, but you know they do need uh, moving it eventually. You can just uh, spray a bit of WD spray on them, or and put a bit of oil on there to run in. Um, but also, if you undo those four bolts, you can actually just rock it the whole assembly over this way a little bit and um, you know get in underneath there there's a there's a nylon pad that it sits on and uh, you can get some grease in around it and clean it up if you need to. Um, okay well that's about it there. might go on to um, you know like the the daily checks for the, for the owner obviously you want to check your oil level around this side there's your dipstick there there's the bottom of the dipstick that's just the the low oil level mark and that's the full oil level mark so if you just wipe it clean and and then check it again um, your coolant, you can see under here. Now, a bit hard to see there in the dark, but if you put a torch up to it, uh, then you can easily see the level of the fluid, and it should be at that on that line, uh, you know, or, or half full anyway, um, when the engine's cold. Okay. Uh, because if that's low, well, first, actually, first of all, let me explain. If it's at the right level and the engine does overheat, then it'll uh, spew out the, any excess coolant as it overheats and the excess coolant will come out up here. So that's a sort of a very basic uh, alarm system for you, you, could, you know, if you're not watching the, the temperature gauge. But it'll only work if you've got enough coolant in there. If you let your coolant get low, obviously the engine can get hotter before it, it uh, spits any coolant out and you haven't got that alarm system anymore. So it's not really the system you want to count on too much, but it, it has saved a few people from cooking their engines. So this uh, is only the first service on this tractor, and you can see the coolant is blue. That's, the, that's what's uh, provided from the factory, is this blue coolant. If you do need to top up, I mean, you shouldn't normally need to top up, but if it's been overheated, you know, if your radiator's clogged up and, you know, it's overheated, um, you know, you shouldn't allow that to happen, but if it does happen, um, and you lose a bit of coolant, then you need to top it up. And uh, but for just small amounts of top up, just top up with, with uh, water, just nice, clean, you know, drinkable water. Um, and that will dilute this a little bit, but a little bit of dilution is fine. Uh, you know, it's recommended to change this every, well, three years, I think, generally they say. Various of different brands, some say two years, some say five years. So please yourself when you're going to change it. I would suggest after three years it'd be a good idea to change it. And but when you change it, because um, I don't think you can buy this brand of coolant in Australia, and I wouldn't recommend mixing them anyway. And after three years you want to change it. So just drop it out. You know, take the bottom radiator hose off, 
uh, and drop all the coolant out, then I would recommend to fill it with, you know, clean rainwater again, run it for a little bit and drop it out again to flush all of the, the blue coolant out and then refill it with the, the stuff you can buy locally. So uh, we use the uh, Royal, that, um, the same oil that we use. They, they have a product called Complete that uh, we use, but you've got to mix 50% uh, with water. Uh, I wouldn't recommend to buy the ones that are already pre-mixed because they're already going off on the shelf um, before you use them and you don't know how long they've been on the shelf for. So um, if you go with the, the ones like the Complete, mix it yourself and 50-50 uh, or as the instructions say. And uh, the critical thing is make sure you fill it up to, to that line when it's cold. And um, yeah, that's probably all you need to know about that. The engines won't overheat you know, unless there's something wrong. And uh, the thing that goes wrong, almost inevitably, you can guarantee it, your radiator is going to block up. That's just what happens to the track if you're working in a dirty environment and, uh, and your airflow blocks up. So you've got your air intake through the grill on the front and the sides there. Depending on what sort of material this, it, it is, sometimes it'll just block up the, these mesh screens. Um, and the air, and the radiator itself is not blocked, but just the mesh is blocked. So if it's the radiator, if it's the grill, sorry, that's blocked, don't try and brush it off here while the engine's running, because as you brush it off, you've got the suction from the fan, and half, you, you might get half of it off, but the other half gets drawn in onto the radiator. So you're just transferring it from the grill to the radiator. Yeah, what you want to do to clean this is have the engine switched off, and then you know you haven't got that suction there you can just brush it off easily and then after you've done that look in here if you shield your eyes you can look in and uh, depending on the light that's around you uh, you'll be able to look in there and see what's in on the radiator and uh, whether that needs cleaning or not. So, um, but when you're but if you're doing a, a, a service you know um, you'll want to clean that radiator anyway because with the daily check the owner we typically just, uh, we'll take that first. Uh, we'll typically just pull the radiator screen out. And here's the radiator screen in here, just slides up. Now, this one here is a bit tight because it wants a bit of uh, silicon spray on, on the rubber there. That's another thing to be aware of. As it comes up, it does hit the bonnet, but then it just flexes and, uh, and slides out. So you take that out and you, and you brush that off and make sure that's all clean. But while we're doing a service, and sometimes for the operator on his daily check too, in dusty conditions, you will need to blow this out daily as well because, you know, the grill catches a certain amount, the radiator screen catches a certain amount, but you will also get a certain amount in certain conditions over time build up in the radiator cores themselves. So that's where we want to use our compressor uh, with the blower, with the, the blower nozzle. This is the, this one here, I'll show you is ideal about that length with a, with a bit of a bend on the end and we just uh, flip that around inside here and uh, blow all that rubbish out so actually if you go around the other side though and as i blow it out you go to see show people what comes out but i'm blowing from here you, you, you go in over the top and show what yeah you, you're good there so there you go yep Actually get it better from this side the way the fins are shaped you can get down to the center there um, and uh, and blow it out you don't just be aware you don't want the the blower nozzle touching the fins on the radiator because you don't want to bend those over that they, they, they're very solid uh, radiator core and fins they're very heavy duty uh, very robust but you know I have seen people poke poke them around in there and, and bend them still, but you've got to be pretty rough to do that. But you don't want that to happen because uh, that stops the air, you know, the airflow can't try to flow through and, and plus the, the dirt build gets stopped in there and, and blocks up in there and can't really clean it out, so we're not properly. So just be aware of that. All right, so putting the radiator screen back in, it's got the little fold at the top which points out to the, away from the engine.
okay, or the front, but to save any confusion away from the engine. Now these rubber slides here, that's where they slide into this slot on the side of the radiator here. And uh, of course they can um, not want to slide easy, but uh, if you keep a bit of silicon spray or talcum powder on, on those, uh, then they slide a lot nicer. So, uh, or graphite powder, if you didn't have any of those. Um, but whatever you've got, and that just slides in. Uh, flush like that, okay. And then the next thing will be the, the air cleaner. So um, this one will need cleaning for sure. So this will be a good demonstration. So they have got a, um, a vacuum uh, sensor switch on the air cleaner. So if the filter gets fully clogged, there's a light that comes on on the dash. Uh, up here, it's a, just an orange light that comes on. I can't show you there now without starting the engine, but there's no need to. You'll, you'll see it come on if the filter's clogged. You can test that light in, in this situation, with the, just start the end tractor up, just the engine idling, and if you just block the airflow, now you don't want to put your hand on there because the suction can be bad for you, but that's why they have that safety hole in the side there so that you, you don't get you know, the full suction force of the engine. But if you get a rag and snuff that airflow, uh, you'll just hear the engine starting to, to slow down by the restricted airflow as, as you'll see that light come on. So it's a good idea to check that when you're doing a service too. So we've got, um, uh, you know, the customer can rely on that. I've never had one play up, by, mind you. They, they're a reliable switch. So, okay, here we go. Look at this. This one's never been cleaned. You can see the, <laughs> the, the dirt in here. But see in here, in up here uh, that, that cut out at the top there. If you look around this side, it says top. Okay, that cavity in behind there down here it will be full of full of uh, dust and uh, take it out mm -hmm. so this shouldn't have been let go this bad um, there's a lot in there and sometimes you might when it's that bad you know the type of material that is you might need a screwdriver or along those pliers to sort of peel it out but if you're doing it regularly like you should be, uh, that'll shake out easily because it won't be so, so bulky and, and matted up in there. And um, if you're doing that, that prolongs the life of, of the element, you know, rather than, you know, once that's full, which that is, that's over full, uh, then that can't work anymore. So that's why it, it had that bulky stuff building up around here. But um, anyway, so do that regularly and, and depending on the conditions you're in, in if you're in clean conditions, you know, if you're mowing golf courses and things, you probably, you know, you do it only every time you do an oil change. But if you're in really dusty conditions, you might want to, you know, shake that cap out, uh, you know, every day. And uh, and then the air cleaner obviously will last longer. But this, I mean, this tractor's done 70 odd hours and this is the first service and it's been in pretty dusty conditions, but real extreme conditions, you might need to do this every day, you know. Uh, so now we'll take that air filter out and you, you want to blow that out as well. Okay, so um, we've got the air compressor and we'll blow that out. Um, while you're at it, you just want to check that the inner is clean. You know, that it, as long as it looks clean, you don't need to touch it. You know, it's only a safety element in case this leaks. when. When you're looking right up the back there, just do that again though, in, in there. If you look right up the back there, see what I'm pointing to up there where the seal touches? Just look there that the, the seal on the element, come back out here again. This seal here has been sealing, uh, you know, against in, in there. Like if there's any trail of dust through here, then you know you've, you've got a problem. It should, should be done up tight enough that it gets a good seal on there. And it, it should be clean on the inside, which it is, if you have a look inside there. Right. And now we'll use our blower nozzle to, to blow this out as well. And you don't want to get too much pressure up, up too close to the paper because apparently you, you can tear them, but I'm just going to blow it like that at an angle. Right, so I'll go around and do all that, then after I finish I'll 
follow it through from the inside. Like that. Um, anyway, I'm not going to do it all on the video. I can do that later. But, um, yeah. And that ideally want to be doing it there where the dust is um, getting back in on it to the safety of the so, um, I'll, I'll finish that off later. This is all cleaned out now and it's good to go back in. Uh, eventually you'll want to replace your, your filter. Uh, I mean you can blow it out quite a few times. I'm not sure what the recommended limit is on how many times you can blow them out but I would suggest you blow them out maybe 10 times. Um, and then you might consider replacing them just as a precautionary thing. Um, I mean, it's probably more related to the years. If you're in a really clean environment and you don't um, blow it out very often, you you know, if you're only blowing it out once a year, uh, you know, like if you're mowing a golf course sort of thing, um, then you might want to only blow it out a couple of times, you know, uh, maybe just replace it every two years, something like that. But when it comes time to replace, that's a uh, a Virgis brand, which isn't a brand that um, you know is readily available here. I mean, we can get the, the genuine part, of course, but um, this is a Baldwin number, which is readily available, and uh, you can get them in other brands as well. But I found some of the other brands. You've got to be a bit careful; they're not always a you know a perfect match. They might fit, but I have had somewhere the the fins are a bit too big, or the holes the wrong size to match the washer. They do come with that washer, but you don't want to use that because this is the special nut that's part of the air cleaner and it's got its own washer and that matches perfectly onto there. So that Baldwin uh, air filter is, is the one to use. Uh, I'll just show you that it does all fit nicely. And um, yeah. There you go, and then when you go to put this cap back on, it's not like cleaned out yet, but just make sure you've got the the top sign facing the top. Okay, and remember to clean that out regularly. That leads us then to doing the engine oil change. Um, so obviously, if you want to get a drain bun, and it's going to a drain bun. What do we need here? A 22 mil. Here it is down here. Oh yeah, and before you do that, it's a good idea just to take the key out so there can't be any accidental start-ups with our oil in it. Now that's flowing out slowly there. If I were to take the dip stick out, which I'm going to do now, you'll see it flow a little bit quicker, I'm sure. There you go, dip stick's up. Put the brake. And, uh, yeah, leave that to, to empty out. I'll, um, I'll set the sump plug, um, well, we can sit it where you like, but I'm just going to sit it there. So now we're going to take the uh, engine oil filter off, which is this one back here. That's the fuel filter, right? That's the engine oil filter. So um, the access to that, it's not too bad, depending, the original filter is, is long and hangs down, and some of the replacement filters, depending on which number you get, can be short and makes the access to them a bit harder. Um, but we'll show you the number uh, of the long one that we'd uh, recommend, which makes it easier to, to get them off. But this type of tool here, the three-pronged tool, is, uh, I think, the best suited to, to this application, getting this filter off. Yeah, the original filters, I find they, um, they mustn't lube the seal when they put them on, and they can be very tight to get off at times. They shouldn't be this tight, but they often are. So, um, uh, after the first service, you know, you shouldn't have this problem, but, um, you yeah, they can be very tight.
Yeah, that was very tight, that filter, but uh, often these, this is the orange factory fitted one, you know, factory fitted by Lombardini, and I suspect they put them on dry, you know, the, the rubber seal is dry and they can be very tight, so just be prepared <laughs> for that for the first service, is uh, if you want one of these good grippy tools, you know, to get them off, uh, makes it a bit easier, but um, yeah, they should never be that tight after the initial one because you meant to put the rubber seal on wet. Okay, so these are the replacement filters. Uh, you can use the, a short one like that, but we would recommend a long one um, because it gives you that easier access onto the, onto the filter. And you don't want to have that um, same problem as we just had there. Uh, where it was tight because they put the rubber seal on dry so uh, we always want to smear a bit of oil over there and we also want to fill the filter with the oil before we put it on so that um, you know you, it doesn't take so long to uh, build up oil pressure when you, you when you start it so we just fill that up here and uh, okay so here's our oil I mean we don't have to use this brand of course but Aussie made so why not I'm sure there's other Aussie made ones too, but anyway, Ultra 2000, I mean, there's various grades you can use, but 15W40, it's not, uh, you know, super highly demanding on its uh, on its grade there. It's, it's not one of these, uh, you know, fancy engines that are very uh, fussy about what oil you use. It's a very old school engine. Just your common, most common diesel engine oil, 15W40. If you look at the grades there after that, that CG4, what is it, SL, that's a higher grade than is specified for this engine, but it doesn't matter that it's higher grade. That's, and I'm just filling it up in the middle. As, if, as it fills up in the middle, then it soaks through the element into the outer side. That's why the level keeps dropping until it eventually you know gets filled right up and you want a little bit of oil around the top there so that you can you know just get a little bit on your finger and wipe it around uh, you know on that rubber seal so I'll put a little bit more on here yet but make sure that rubber seal is wet and just finish filling that up See the last of the air bubbles coming out there now. I'd imagine we're getting towards the end of them. Eventually they'll stop and the level will stay still. Anyway, it doesn't have to be all that full. It, like, that's plenty full enough. Give us a pump more in there as soon as we start up. Okay, so now very important to keep this area clean as we're putting it on. You don't want to, you know, be clumsy there and touch it against some dirty part of the you know the chassis or something and drop dirt in there obviously you're feeding dirt straight into your engine uh, so you want to be careful that you aim straight you know get lay down and look up there if you can so that you can see what you're doing and get it straight you know onto the to the position where it has to go You've got to go in a little bit of an angle there, so like that, so if you do it quickly so you don't spill any oil. And you do it up till the seal touches, and then I think they say two thirds of a turn uh, after that. But I mean, I just know the tension to do it too. But they don't need to be super tight. Alright, so that's just up till it's sort of touching and um, I 
if you got a, if you can get a good grip on it, as tight as you can do by hand, but uh, is is adequate. But um, in this situation, it's you can't really get a great grip on it. Almost, but yeah, it might be advisable just to go a little bit more with the with the tool. But um, it's up to your discretion on that one. Just when you're taking the filter off, of course, it doesn't matter if you damage it. It, it, but when you're putting it on, you don't want to. Oh, I'm in the wrong position there. Got to go back around the other way. That's it. Plenty tight enough. Yeah. Can't undo it by hand, it should be good. The oil drained, and now we're going to put sump plug back in. And again, um, don't get clumsy with the sump plug and get it dirty. Make sure it stays clean. Uh, now, just check for the washer, the sealing washer. So there's no washer on the on the nut there. So we want to see if it's on the sump or whether it's fallen off into the oil. And I think it must be down in the oil. Okay, so when you go to put the sump plug back on, you gotta look for the sealing washer because it may have stayed with the sump plug, it may have stayed on the sump, or it may have fallen into your dirty oil, which was our case, it, that's where we found it, in the oil. So make sure you, you find that, and uh, it's just a copper washer. Eventually it will need replacing, but um, you know, you just gotta judge that as it goes. I mean. I guess if ever it leaks, replace it. Um, and if whatever, you know, if you inspect it and it looks reasonable, you can keep using it. And then again, we want our 20 mil, 22 mil socket. doesn't need to be super tight. It's just got to be tight enough to not come out. Uh, okay, then we're ready to put our oil back in. And of course the best thing you can do is have one of these drum pumps. It makes life easy, but you can pour it in. Uh, depends on the, the drum you're pouring it out of as to how difficult that would be. Now, before we go taking this um, oil filler cap off, that's where you really want to get your blower nozzle and blow that clean too. So we didn't do that before, so I'm just going to do that now. Yep. And start pumping. Uh, I'd like to be able to tell you how many pumps it takes to fill it, but that's going to depend on your uh, on your drum pump. So it could be a good idea to maybe pump into a like a one litre measuring uh, container, so you know how many pumps to the litre, and then you can work it out from there. Um, the worst thing you can do is overfill it, you know, you just keep pumping it and um, until you get a reading on the on the dipstick and just come up slowly like that. Gonna so, see if we can read where it's at. There you go. So we're up to there. We're up to our full mark there. there now. Uh, but we haven't started the engine either, so what we need to do now is uh, take our drum pump out, put our cap back in. And, uh, and start it. As soon as we start it, we want to check the oil pressure. Light goes out in a reasonable time. And uh, let it run for a bit, and then we'll recheck it, and no doubt we'll have to top it up just a little bit, I would expect. Um, so anyway, that's what we're going to do now. Okay, so we're just doing the first start up after the oil change. Uh, so I'm just focusing here so you can see the uh, oil light. So you can see the oil light uh, left hand side second from the top there, underneath the alternator light. 
and uh, we're just going to start it up and uh, see how long that takes to go out. <laughs> After we start, started the engine, checked the oil pressure, light went out, uh, uh, and we got the oil, you know, filled up with the oil filter and, and so on, and the uh, motor. Now we want to recheck that oil level, but unless we've let it warm up, uh, it takes, you know, the cold oil is thick and it takes a while to run back down the bottom. So you either want to let your engine warm up to operating temp, or close to operating temp, uh, or give it a good, 20 minutes at least, I'd reckon. Um, you know, go and have your morning tea and uh, let that um, oil run back down the bottom before you do your final oil level check and top it up again if necessary. Yeah, just uh, check your fan belt tension. I mean, just push on it there. That's sort of, that's quite adequate where that is. And, um, you know, it's pretty straightforward on how to tighten that if you need to. There's adjustment bolts underneath there. And uh, if you're prying it out, just for the, the home mechanic, um, be careful where you pry it from. You always want to pry it from on this housing, not this one, because if you pry it out on the back housing, you can twist the, you know, the, the alignment of the two and misalign your bearings. So you, you want to get down underneath there where you can... Um, you know, prior on that piece there to, to pull it out, you know, in underneath it, there where my finger is. Okay. And then tighten up that bolt there. Okay. All right, so we, after we've run the engine, you know, filled up, finished filling up the filter and so on, uh, the oil level's a bit low and we've topped it up again. So we've ended up doing 84 pumps, which is uh, 10 litres and uh, and we reckon that's on the, on the right level. So it uh, holds a bit more than we thought, but anyway, that's how you can check it, just like that. Okay. So that's our uh, engine all done. Don't forget to put your oil cap back on after doing that. All right, so I'm just gonna talk about the fuel filter now. So. That's not something that uh, needs to be done at a certain hour interval. I mean, uh, you probably should maybe after every um, 500 hours or every couple of years just replace it uh, as a precautionary. But the thing is, you can have clean fuel and if the tractor's always in the shed and there's no condensation building up in the tank, you know, a filter can last a long time, but then you can get one bad batch of fuel, a dirty uh, jerry can of fuel or something, and, uh, and it can be blocked straight away. So you should always have a fuel filter on hand if that happens. And um, to replace the filter, um, and that's the filter that, uh, that we have, but the common one that you would buy, uh, you know, if you're just sourcing them locally, uh, a Baldwin BF788 is, is a common number. Uh, and uh, that's what you would uh, replace it with. And the fuel filter is down here, that's it there. So remember the oil filter's up there, there's the fuel filter. Now to replace the fuel filter, um, uh, you know, obviously unscrew it and just replace it. Obviously better if you fill the, fill the filter with diesel before you put it on, so you haven't got that big air cavity in there. So I would suggest before you even start, get some, obviously you want to make sure it's super clean diesel and, and put in there because part of it will be unfiltered, you know, half of it uh, is going to be on the filter on the dirty side of the element and half will be on the clean side going directly into the injector pump. So be super clean with that and uh, and have it clean, uh, have it full ready to put on. So spin that one off and put the other one, the new one on. After you've done that though, you will need to bleed it. Um, although if you do it like I just said, and, and the filter's full, you possibly don't need to bleed it. You probably just start it and run, and it might just run rough for a little bit and, and clear itself. But if you do need to bleed it, uh, that is the highest bleed point. That's where it come, the fuel line comes up from the uh, filter up, up into the shut-off solenoid before it goes into the injectors. So you can bleed it there. And here's the fuel lift pump. And see down here, come back here to me, uh, that hose there, just if you come back further, if you push that hose down, then you can get access to there. 
Right, and there's the fuel lift pump. Now, at the moment, the cam is holding the plunger down, so that's going quite easily to there, and then it's working from there. But if I started the engine and turned the engine over, you'd probably find it would start working from up here somewhere. But either way, it still works. you just got to push it hard and further down when it gets hard. And um, But, yeah, it would be more effective if the load was in a different spot. Uh, and just pump it until you get all the air out of there. Do that back up again, and uh, uh, away you go. So yeah, I think that's all you need to know about the, the fuel filter. All right, so we're just jacking this underneath the, the sump guard, but underneath that support stand for it. So we want this underneath that. You, know, you, don't, you don't want to be jacking up here or out on the corner, right underneath that post there where it can't bend anything, and that's where we're going to jack it on the engine end. Alright, so we've jacked up the uh, engine end axle, so we can change the oil in these uh, planetary reduction hubs. Uh, so you need to back, jack up both sides, because you need to turn the final drive, because you see the two, two plugs, one large one and one small one. And, uh, you know, you've got to spin it around, we want the big one to the bottom to drain the oil and uh, and then after we finish we'll uh, we'll put the big one at the top so we can fill it and then this little one becomes the um, the level that we pump it up to when we're draining we need the little one out also to allow it to breathe so we've just got to spin that around now and um, yeah, you couldn't do that if the other wheel was on the ground obviously so just get the big one to the bottom and then we undo these two. So you need a 5 mil and a 6 mil Allen key. And, uh, and you just want to be careful. I mean, look, there's a little rattle gun. There's a big one. That big one has got enough power to, to shear that off, you know. So, you, like, you got, you got to know what you're doing with these things. Otherwise, you know, if you're using hand uh, tools, that's probably better for this situation. So I wouldn't really recommend using a big, powerful rattle gun. Uh, but... I'm used to it, I know what I'm doing, I'm only undoing it and I'm not pulling the trigger the full, the full way to do this. So, I'll take that out. Now, these have got built in, um, the O-ring is, is uh, built into it, what do you call it, encapsulated into that plug there. So, you shouldn't lose the O-ring, but, you know, just check that it hasn't uh, fallen out in the in the process and uh, now we need the, the smaller one the five mil one to one the vent because you can see it's sort of gurgling trying to trying to come out of there um, and when I take this one out it'll come out a lot quicker it'll still be a bit slow because it's gear oil it's 80 90 or 85 140 gear oil and um, it's going to be uh, thick and slow it doesn't really matter whether you use 80, 90 or 85, 140. I had already cut that one off. So there you go. Now it's flowing out a lot quicker. And this one's got a little copper washer on it, you can see. So make sure you don't lose the, the copper washer. So here's the oil that come out of it. And if you come out in the sun, you can see it's quite glittery. But that is perfectly normal for a planetary final drive like on the first service uh, I've been doing this all my life and it doesn't matter what brand of tractor you get that amount of glitter is about as good as you'll ever get well it is as good as you'll ever get actually it's just what you expect on a first service so don't be alarmed by that but if it's um, you know more than that then certainly let us know um, but yeah anyway for. Now, before we go, well, we're ready to go putting oil back in again. I've turned it around so the, the big hole is up the top now with the little one on the side for the level. So we could just fill it up to that level and away we go. But uh, look, if you want to be really pedantic and super nice, what you could do, what we're going to do here now, is just put just two strokes in here. I'm not going to fill it right up. Oh well, let's say three strokes will do. Oop. Oh, that wouldn't be full because I've pumped it in too quick. And uh, 
wouldn't have given it time to level out and flow into the crevices because it's very thick oil. But, um, but what we're going to do there, uh, here now, is just put the plugs in. Whoop. Just temporarily. And, um, and we're going to spin it around and then drain it again just to flush, you know, get all that old oil out of it. Because it is only a small uh, compartment of oil. And, uh, you know, just to get it flushed out as, as, as good as we possibly can. I'd probably only do this on the first service. I would keep doing it after there. Remember, this is a major service item. This is every, well, I would suggest every 500 hours I'd recommend to do it. I'm not sure what the book says. I think it might say 400, but um, anyway, take your pick there. So we're just spinning that around to, you know, mix that oil up a bit. Get the big plug back at the bottom and uh, we'll drain it again. We'll just take the vent hole out first. Ooh, now, copper washer has stayed in there that time. So I've either got to leave it in there or just be aware of where it is, you know, just make sure the copper washer doesn't get lost. Um, oh yeah, oh, I can pick it out with a scribe, but I think I'll just leave it in there. Dave, will do. Make sure the drain bung's there. And see, that was clean oil, but see how much it's not clean anymore? So that sort of proves that that's a worthwhile thing to do. You can see the, glit the glitter in it again. And uh, we'll just leave that to drain and then we'll fill it up. And it'll be all right. Okay, so that's finished draining enough for that now. That's our, our second drain of flushing of it. So we'll just spin it around now to the large hole is up the top. And we'll, now we're going to pump the oil in nice and slowly so we don't overfill it. Uh, so it doesn't flow out before it's full, you know, like it did last time. Uh, we'll see how many pumps it takes. Okay, so there we have the oil flowing out. There's our level. Now, um, we just did a little experiment there. We, we pumped it in nice and slow till it came out there. Then we put the bungs back in and spun it around once and rechecked the level. And then it took a bit more, about another quarter of a stroke uh, because there's some air bubbles in there. You know, it's thick oil and in amongst all the gears there. Uh, so that was a good idea. I think worth doing that to to uh, get the right level and uh, now we'll put those um, plugs back in again making sure the copper washer is in place for the little one and uh, of course the big one looking for the encapsulated washer Okay, so that's it for the engine end final drives. Uh, obviously do the same for the other side. And then next we're going to do the, the rear transmission and the rear final drives. And uh, just make sure you get your studs lined up, you know, like you might have to rotate it a bit like that, you know, whatever to, to get your studs lined up. But um, I can look at it down through here and see that they're lined up there now. Get a pry bar underneath, I find is the best way. And roll it up on and then you can just lift it up in, in this position like that. And uh, yeah, there's a bit to explain about putting these wheel nuts on, but I'll just um, get that one in position first. And then I'll explain what I want to explain. So, first of all, early model AGTs had a countersunk 
wheel nut like that because the rim was also countersunk for that to sit into. So uh, if you've got that style, it's, it's easy, very obvious to pick and uh, don't go putting the wheel nuts on that way because then it does, it's not designed to be that way. Okay, so make sure it goes on that way if you've got the, the tapered wheel nuts with the tapered rim. The later ones, the rims aren't tapered and we have a spring disc washer. Now, just to explain what a spring disc washer is, it look, just looks like a flat washer to anyone who doesn't know how to pick the difference. But the difference is, if you put them that way, you can see that there's a gap there. Right? If I put them that way, there's no gap. That's because they're concave or convex, depending which way you put them. See, like that, there's a, there's a gap in the middle and no gap on the outside. If I go the other way, the gap is on the outside. Right, so when you put them on, you've got to put them so that the, they're, they're flat on the outside. So it should be touching the rim there. So if I go this way, you'll have a gap there. Probably a bit hard to see on the camera there, but there's a, you know, about a one and a half mil gap around the outside of that. You know, it's not sitting flat, whereas this way, it's sitting flat on the rim. Okay, and then when the, the nut comes on, it it squashes that washer flat because it's made out of spring steel. It's not an ordinary washer. It's called a spring disc washer, also known as a Bellevue washer. A uh, Bell, oh, I think they're called. Is it Bell something? Anyway, I forget. Doesn't matter. Um, so make sure you put them on like that. There's a sticker there that tells you spring disc washers must be fitted in concave position. Okay. Now uh, it's not critical, but we just like to keep these threads oiled. Everything likes to be oiled, well lubed, and a little bit of oil on the threads there is nice. I mean, we do it when we're putting them together, you know, new, and uh, whenever you got them off, just keeps all, everything happy. This has been really fussy, I know, but like that nut has been on in that direction before, so you can see it's rubbed the, the zinc coating off it a little bit, whereas that side hasn't been rubbed. We've just been a bit fussy, but we like to put them back on the same way, so the outside of the, the nut always looks nice, you know, put them back on the same way they came off. Anyway, once they get mixed up, it, whereas it doesn't matter, but that's just us. Okay, so as you do those up, uh, I mean, you know, you, you probably know, most people would know to alternate, get, to get, don't just go around in a circle. Uh, but as you do them up, that spring dishwasher gets flattened out. So you, if you've got a really good eye, you can actually pick it to see whether they're flat or not. Um, but yeah, that's what you want them to do to flatten out. Um, so yeah, they're not an, an essential thing. You don't need it. I mean, it's a very strong design with eight studs. It's, um, it's really massively over-engineered. Um, so therefore, the torque's not super critical, but as long as those spring disc washers are flattened out, um, they're good. Let me talk about the rear transmission oil now. So the rear transmission oil, that's the gearbox and the hydraulics and the rear end. And if you're looking down here, there's the, the dipstick for it. You unscrew that, it's also a breather on top. You unscrew that uh, and it's got a dipstick on it about, I don't know, nine or 10 inches long. Uh, so that's where you fill it. But that oil from that gearbox uh, flows out to these final drives. So you don't have to fill them. When you fill the final drive, when you fill the transmission, it flows out there. But when we drain the oil, we do need to drain them because it can't flow from there back in. Okay, it's like a one-way trip. And uh, so we're gonna drain the oil initially down here at the filter. We're gonna drop that into the into the drum there. But that doesn't that gets most of the oil. So to get all the oil, there's another drain bung down in the centre there. We'll do that. So we do the filter first, drain bung second, and then we do each final drive to get that last little, you know, like about 500 mil out of those. Um, final drives and then we'll only refill it from the one point in the middle. Uh, so um, now with this filter here, that's the, uh, you know where it takes the oil 
from the transmission up to the hydraulic pump, that's your hydraulic filter. If it gets clogged, the way you'll tell that the, the sign that the filter's getting clogged is that when you start it in the morning, when it's cold, initially, like, you know, first five seconds or 10 seconds, you won't have any steering or hydraulics. It just takes a little while for it to draw that oil through and then, then it comes good. So if it starts doing that, having that little bit of a delay in the hydraulics, that's telling you that it, it wants a filter change. Um, so um, nothing to be too alarmed about, but just something to be aware of. Uh, so anyway, we're gonna show you how to change that filter and also, um, like you could change that filter without dropping the oil, uh, but we're gonna do an oil change at the same time. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've already loosened off that hose clamp there because when we pull this down, we want to pivot on that joint there to, to drain the oil, okay? And I've already uh, undone these screws. So, uh, I've been cheating a bit. All right, you can see that dropping down as I do it. And as that comes down, you see the filter there? And if I wriggle the, grab hold of the filter and wriggle it with it, or I could probably get a flat screwdriver and pry it down, which it might be best to do that to demonstrate how that works. Yep. So, uh, yeah, that's not gonna come down because that comes down to there and it hits the, the axle housing. And you're not gonna get out till the filter drops away from where it connects to this tube. And it's got a like a press on O-ring fitting there. So you need to just pry that down. Uh, just a flat screwdriver there. It's perfect for that job. And once the filter's clear, then you can get this away like that. Now, as we spill that oil there, you'll see this O-ring which is critical not to lose that because if you lose that o-ring when it goes back together uh, it'll be similar to um, having a blocked filter because it'll be sucking air in there and uh, it'll make the uh, the oil the pump the hydraulic pump sort of surging for, for air you know so um you, you'll notice it if you leave that out if you forget about it um, that's important. Now as I take this filter out, I can just lift that out, like so. But the outside of this element is the dirty... But because it's the, out, because it's the outside there, there's also going to be sediment down the bottom. So that's why it's a good idea to drain the oil here, because you're flushing it. If I spin this upside down, I'm flushing any sediment out of the bottom there that could have been in it. So we're, we're flushing out the housing as well as draining the oil out of the gearbox by doing this. It'll just continue to flow there. And if I go and take the hook stick out, it'll flow even quicker. It can breathe easier. So you just watch it down there, Dave, as I uh, take the dip stick out. I'm sure you'll see the flow rate increase there. Here's it comes now. that speed up. And you can come on here and have a look at the dip stick. There's, there's the dip stick that came out of there. It looks like it's not going to come out because it's going to clash with that hose, but as it comes up, then, then it comes out like that. It's not a problem. Okay, and there's the, the two levels. That's the, the minimum, oh, you know, that one there's the minimum mark. That's the full mark, but it doesn't hurt to overfill it. You know, from new, we usually send it out about 15 mil over the, the full mark. So, you know, as long as it's on the full mark or a bit over it, that's, uh, that's fine. Yeah, I'll leave that out because we've got to fill that shortly. Okay, so that's our initial drain point. Uh, you can see it's pretty much stopped there now. So uh, we could put the new filter back in, but we've still got to continue draining back here. So I think I'll put the, the new filter in now because I want to take this, uh, this container away from here. Okay, so I've cleaned up the O-ring. We've got our new filter. Uh, we've just got to put it all back in place. I mean, you can look in there and make sure it looks clean. But 
There it is. Drop that in there. Lowering in place in the, in the groove. And then get this in place. As it's got to come in so that tab there is over the, the rocks frame. And then line it up there so the filter goes in. And just in like that. Hold up there while we put our bulbs in. All right, so there, there's the suction line down here. Uh, it's a good idea to have a look there, see if there's any weeping going on and maybe tighten that hose clamp. And on the earlier ones, um, I did notice a few, quite a few of them would weep there and you'd tighten them up and the hose clamp would bottom out. So uh, if that happens, I'd take the hose clamp, loosen off the hose clamp and get a bit of, uh, like a, a bit of something to act as packing underneath there. So. Uh, a bit of cloth tape is ideal, um, anything like that to, to just pack it up a little bit, a little bit of rubber even, and uh, and then just redo up the hose clamp. But anyway, all, all the later ones now yeah, for quite a while have had a, a good match there with the hose clamp. Um, and as you can see there, there's no sign of any weepage. But down here, this is the, the drain point. So that draining it at the filter, you know, almost gets all the oil but just leaves this last little bit in here you'll see how much it is in a minute i doubt it's even two litres and that's got a little magnetic uh, piece on it to attract any any particles which you can see forming in there they only you know they feel like just powder really um, there's nothing gritty in there, or very little. Uh, that's perfectly normal, so we'll try and clean that off the best we can. And also again, there's a little sealing washer, so make sure you don't lose that. It may stay stuck up there with the transmission, it may come off with the plug, or it might end up in your oil, but make sure it goes back on. So I'm just going to hop out now and clean that up before I put that back in. Okay, so I'm just putting that sump plug back in. Again, grab my 18mm spanner in this case. And there you go, that's plenty tight enough. Alright, so that's um, that's the, the first two drain points. And now we've got to get out and do the, the final drives. I'm just, I've just turned that by hand uh, to get that right at the bottom. Pretty close, I'm just undoing it with my 6mm Allen key. Again, safer to do it with a hand tool, but you know, just be careful if you've got these powerful rattle guns. Again, look for the ceiling O-ring, or quad ring it might be, but it's an encapsulated rubber ring in there. And we just let that drain. We don't have to refill it because when we fill the transmission, it'll automatically flow back over into into this side and we don't need to check the oil level either even though it's got a plug there that you can do it because it's the same final drive as on the on the steer axle uh, but it works differently so uh, i'll just leave that now for a little while to drain all right so we've got our drum i mean this is we keep refilling this drum uh, from our 205 litre uh, but it's um I mean, that tells you the brand royal and it's agri trans but most other brands will have an oil called Agri-Trans or something similar, 10W30. It's just your common agricultural tractor transmission oil. It does your gearbox, it does the hydraulics, it does the wet brakes and wet clutch, um, which, you know, is, is pretty common. I mean, not all tractors have a wet clutch, but they mostly these days would have a wet PDO clutch at least. I mean, this has both. Um, but yeah, it's still the same oil, common tractor transmission oil. And if you sit the drum there, if you've got this style of drum pump, and sit it there, that gives you this hose a nice length, and I can reach easily in through here to put that hose in position. Okay, so it just sits in there, and start pumping. Okay, so we've just been filling the transmission. We've just put 120 pumps into the gearbox, and at that point it started to overflow out of this final drive. So that's the point where it uh, you know, reaches that level where it can flow across. 
it's nowhere near the full mark. Oh, well, it's getting near the full mark, I guess, but it's still got a while to go. So oh, we were just curious to see how much it would take. Uh, so that's 120 pumps times 120 mil per stroke. And, um, and it's starting to flow across to the final drive. But now, as we continue to fill the transmission, pump it up more, it will fill that It'll fill that up to, to the level it wants to be at. Okay, so we've just finished filling the transmission. It took 210 pumps. We're, we're not actually sure what this pump's delivering per stroke, um, but judging what's left in the drum there, I think it's around about 18 litres that we've used uh, to do the service, uh, to, to refill it. Um, and when we filled it, we got to about 180 strokes and we we're getting the right reading on the dipstick. But what happens in this gearbox, if you want to just come up a bit closer to that, is there's a division in the middle here. It's all the same oil, but it takes a while for it to flow from this part of the gearbox into this part of the gearbox, right? So if you pump it, the oil in and you check the oil, you're going to get a falsely high reading. You've either got to let it sit for quite a while for it to slowly flow through into here. But what you do, if you look at this hydraulic hose, that's a return line from the um, hydraulic control valve here. As soon as you start the, the motor, it's drawing oil out of this rear end from that big hose down the bottom, and it's pumping it back into this end. So it automatically brings the level back to, to where it should be. So just start the engine. You only gotta run it for 10 or 15 seconds. Switch it off and recheck your oil level, and um, and then after that we've topped it back up to uh, well, like I said, it took 210 strokes, which I you know I expect about 18 liters. I estimate about 18 liters, but that gives us a reading above that line there. So it's up about we've got it up about probably 15 mil above that um, the top line. It's not super critical. If it's on the line, that's fine, but. We just like having a little bit extra. Um, there's no problem with, I mean, you don't want to go too full because you will run into problems there eventually. Um, but, you know, you can blow a hose or, you know, have a loose fitting or something could happen. And, you know, every time you uncouple your, your couplings, you can lose a little bit of oil. So it's only going to go down, it's not going to go up. And um, anyway, it's still something you want to keep an eye on periodically too in between services. Especially if ever you've uh, had a loose hose, you need to check it straight away because you can't, don't know how much you've lost. But it also, if you've got a new implement and the cylinders could be empty, the hoses and cylinders could be empty and it could take quite a bit of oil to fill those and then your transmission's low. So if, that, if you ever get a new implement on here, straight away check your oil afterwards. Uh, anyway, so that's it for that. We screw that back in. Now I'm screwing that in, I'll put it in here. Put that back in and we'll screw it up. It's only got an O-ring on there, it doesn't need to be tight. It's not an encapsulated O-ring, so if you do it up too tight, you'll squeeze the O-ring out. So that's just finger tight and then you know, shift it on there and just like that much more. Overall, not even a quarter of a turn, probably. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's plenty tight enough. Okay, so that's... Um, that's it for all the oil changes. Then the other things we need to talk about are just adjustments. We want to check our, our brake adjustment uh, because that um, uh, depends on who the operator is and whether they've driven it with a handbrake on. If they've driven it with the handbrake on, uh, then your brakes will need readjusting. Uh, so that's the most likely one. Uh, you also, as the tractors get older, you want to check the free play on the, um, on the clutch pedal. Remember you've got two clutch pedals and two sets of brake pedals because of the reversible console. So if I put the pedal over here, you can see it's operating here, but that's the amount of free play, which is, you know, quite a lot, but it's, that's not a problem. That's not too much. Um, if it gets down to only, say, 10 mil, you'd certainly want to uh, adjust it back up at the moment. I don't know, I'm guessing that's probably about 30 mil. So yeah, 25 to 30 mil is probably the ideal now. The adjustment for that free play is there. You just nip that one up a little bit. 
just a nylock nut, so just nip it up until you get the right amount of free play. But also in your service, always make sure that when you let go of that pedal, it comes up, right? It should move freely, and that Oki strap there should pull it back up. The original design has a coil spring underneath, um, but um, we found that Oki strap just works a lot better. I know it probably looks a little bit hodgy, but it just works well. And eventually that Oki strap will need replacing, but we use a good quality um, latex uh, Oki strap and they last a long time. If you buy the cheap ones, they don't last very long at all and they just go saggy. So when it needs replacing, it's a 600 mil um, or 24 inch Oki strap make sure it's latex and uh, yeah like I said just check that that comes back up freely you shouldn't you shouldn't have to like if it just stops there and you've got to pull it back up then you've got a problem you're, you're not fully releasing your your clutch and you're riding on the thrust bearing and you you can cause your, your clutch to slip uh, but it's a wet clutch it runs in the oil so you can cop a lot of abuse but still you don't want to unnecessarily abuse it um, but yeah, the next thing is we want to talk about the brakes and um, here's the, the brake pedal for, for when you were facing, you know, the, the PTO end. There's another set of brake pedals over there. But that's the original pedal there and this is our ex extended brake pedal which just means you need less effort on the, on the pedal. We developed that for a customer who was very light and, and um, you know, that just had trouble putting enough you know force on the on the pedal so uh, we we built that for them and uh, we decided it was a good idea for everyone to have because it just makes makes it easier you know less effort on the on the pedal so um we made that standard all the early ogts don't have that uh, but whether you got it or not you've got to check the, you know the, the pedal now that does actually want adjusting up a little bit so i'd say someone's driven with the handbrake on um because the thing about the handbrake is it's quite a bad design I must admit for when you're facing this direction when you spin the seat around it, it's quite comfortable to pull it on you can pull it on quite you know quite well but for this direction you just can't get enough force on that lever the trick to it is whenever you apply the, the park brake is, is as you sit in the tractor put your heel over here on this set of pedals and you push down on that as you stand up lean up on here not on the, on the dash panel and you push your weight on the pedal and as you do that pulls up really easy and you get you'll get the brake like if i pull that on as tight as i can by hand and then do it again with this method i'll get another three clicks out too quickly uh, and that means it's on tight enough then that people aren't going to accidentally drive with the handbrake on uh, there's a bit of an act to getting it off just make sure you put your weight on there with the heel and use it. i just use my little finger there and it's quite easy to get off okay so that's the the trick to the handbrake but like i said if someone has just pulled it on like that then you can easily drive off with the handbrake on and you're wearing out the brake pads then the brakes need adjusting um i'm not sure how many times you can adjust these brakes up nobody's ever had to replace brake pads in them yet but it is a big job to replace wet you know brake pads uh, they do last a long time and like i said we've never had to replace them but if someone keeps doing that, they will eventually have to replace them, I'm sure. Um, so, yeah, good idea for, the, for them to learn not to do that. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, with that amount of travel, there's a, there's a sticker here that comes with this pedal. talks about how much free travel it should have. Um, ideally, 65 mil if you measure from the floor up to here. And then you put your foot on the pedal and measure it again. You know, you should have 65 mil of travel is the ideal adjustment. It says 80 mil is the maximum, right? So um, if, if you've got more than 80 mil of movement there, then you're asking for trouble. And you don't want to be on a steep slope and find your, your pedals not effective. Uh, so keep that adjusted up and we're going to get underneath and show you how to adjust it. Um, the other way you can tell, rather than measuring that movement of the pedal, is if you look down here, that brake link there. Can you see my hand on there? Just now go forward a bit there, that one there. You know, if I um, move that up and down, that amount of movement is quite excessive. And the adjustment isn't those two nuts, it's back further, and back, back about here. 
um, there's a lock nut and the adjustment that you do up. And we want to do it so it still can move up and down, but not that much. Okay, we'll show you what it is. But that's how you can easily check. You can also do the same on this side if you want to come on this one. Here's the one on this side. And there it is there. And I can check the adjustment just by, you know, feeling that there. Okay. But I'll show you underneath how to adjust it. And all right, so here we are. Can you see up here? Yep. Um, there's that, that brake link. And like I said, it's not those two there. They're just keeping the tension on that spring there. Back here is our adjustment. We undo that lock nut, and there's our adjustment there. There's a hex out there, and there's also a hex inside. But see this amount of movement? That's, that's the excessive movement we want to get rid of. Not totally, because if you got rid of it all together, then your brakes would be dragging. Okay, so I'm just going to crack that off now and um, show you how that's done it's a little bit awkward all right loosen off the lock nut and just wind it, winding it back a bit so i can screw this one up and i can just wind it up by hand so that's a 19 mil the the lock nut and then this one back here is a 17 okay but you can generally do it by hand while they're new anyway uh winding that one around otherwise i'll grab my 17 and uh, put it on here and wind it up so i just keep winding that up i don't want to get it tight i just want to get it to the point where i'm i haven't measured this but i'm estimating the movement on this piece here is up and down about 15 mil and i don't know i reckon that'd be pretty close there actually getting close anyway See, that's too tight, right? It's got no, I mean, if there's a little bit of movement, it's actually tight on there, right? So, you've got to have free play. It's also got to allow, allow for a little bit of expansion, you know, due to heat and so on. Um, I reckon that's pretty close to the mark there. I'll just go a little bit more. Yep, and I'm going to hold it there. Well, I'll lock it up. Right. There we go. And that's that adjustment done. Okay, so we've got to do the same on the other side. And uh, we'll move. There we are. I don't know whether you need to record the other side, but although actually it probably is because the other side. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult actually because it's got, I think it is, isn't it? Uh, it's got this other, something else obstructing it anyway. Don't know whether it must be this uh, pedal here, but it, it is a little bit more awkward. I must admit it's not the, the uh, easiest thing, but it's not impossible. It's just awkward, maybe. Depends who you are. Depends on you attitude to life <laughs> perhaps uh, so yeah this one here i find using the spanner i go half one way and half the other uh, actually was there another trick to it i think there was in there no, yeah in this way that's right yep. and i'm just checking the, the amount of movement as i go I mean, the other thing is you can just wind it up until you, you, you feel that that free play is gone, like there now, and then go back a certain amount, I guess. I'm only going back half a hex at a time there. So now I've gone back two hexes, and I'd say that's about right. So there you go. That's another way you could do it. And then I need to just lock that one up, making sure my adjustment doesn't change. And I'm trying to do this and keep keep clear for the camera to see what's going on at the same time or makes it a little bit more difficult. I think mean, more interesting. Anyway, there you go. That's um 
that's done there. And uh, that should be good. Uh, what else do we need to explain down here, Dave? I don't think there's anything. Oh, these links here, they're to adjust, um, well, this is the primary brake adjustment between the brakes and these pedals. And then these are the adjustments between these pedals and this pedal. So with it, without your foot on the pedal as, as it is there now, these should be just slightly loose. Yeah, there's that one there, and there's that one there. Okay, so you, yeah, that one's loose, and yeah, that one's loose. So you could, if you wanted to adjust them up, but they're not super critical, really. Um, because if you're out in that adjustment, you can override it with this adjustment. But if you want to be really thorough, get that one spot on, and then just adjust those ones up as tight as you can, but as long as it's still loose. Um, is, is what you want. Uh, okay, I think that's about it under here. Another thing to check for doing the service is the hand throttle. There's a friction lock on here. So when you bring your throttle down, I mean that's at idle, and that's about where you'd have for your working revs. And actually I can tell that one almost wants adjusting up. But after they, they've been used a bit, they start to slip too easy and you'll set your throttle. You go along and your revs slowly come back a little bit. So you just got to nip that up a little bit. It's just a nylon nut onto a uh, onto a big Belleville washer action. Uh, so just go a little bit there, yep, and just so it doesn't feel like it wants to or could come back on its own. Okay, so that's pretty good there. Um, yeah, that's it.